Hey, weirdos, I am Ash. And I am Elena. And this is Morbid. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, yeah. I told them. <laughs> yeah, I told that. them already. You got it. We are crazed individuals today, just <laughs> last minute holiday shopping. Oh my fucking God. Yeah. Consumerism, man. Yeah. And by the time you guys are hearing this, it's well over and you're probably like, you're like, whew, why are you holiday shopping? People are like twitching in their yeah. cars. They're like, no, we have like 365 more days until we have to do that again. Honestly, I'm going to start. 365 days ahead. like i'm gonna start 364 days that's the thing i time. always say i'm gonna be early and i was slightly early a little bit this time but then i i teetered off like i started strong and then i just everything got chaotic and at the end i just fucked myself <laughs> like this christmas i don't know what I was doing, well, I know what I was, I was doing. I was going to say, I know what you were doing. I, it's just been a lot. It's been a busy, busy second half of the year for us. So yeah. I think uh, the holidays just, uh, they just compounded on top of it. Yeah. And, Drew damn. was like, I got you this much. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you do? Don't return some of that. What you mean? Like, I don't have that. I don't have that much for you. I don't have that. But then I, I thought that last night and then I came here and I've hidden some presents here and I was like, oh shit. Yeah, that's true. I have you, those. You forgot like one pretty <laughs> one significant present. Diesel present. Yeah. And then another one is coming after Christmas. And I'm so TO'd because um it's it's Drew's big present. So Seth Rogan, I have a bone to pick with you. <laughs> no, not actually. It's my own fault for ordering it late. <laughs> I don't have a bone to pick for you. <laughs> I would never have a bone to pick with Seth Rogan. I love that man. Who doesn't? You know? probably people that suck i guess i mean there's people who hate everybody so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you know well yeah so that's here we are that's that speaking but... of hate <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, let's get into I it i hate the man in this story yeah so there you go that was a good segue perfect let's start we're let's going go. not in the way back machine but we're we're going back to the early aughts we're or going the... to ashtastic Early aughts. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. On February 12th, 2007. 2007. I was going to say 2007, but that sounded weird. <laughs> but that's where our story begins. And on that day, a frantic Toronto caller was on the phone with 911 begging for help. The man on the line was 35-year-old Christopher Little, and he was explaining to the dispatcher that there was a dead woman hanging from the rafters in his garage. Oh, my God. And he had no idea who this woman was. What? And then as he walked into his home, things only got worse. He made his way to the bedroom he shared with his estranged wife, Julie Crocker, and discovered her dead as well, having been brutally murdered. What the fuck? She was lying on the bathroom floor, or excuse me, lying on the bedroom floor next to the bed with her throat cut open viciously. Oh, my God. Nearly to the point of decapitation. Oh, He immediately assumed that whoever the stranger was hanging in the garage had done this to his wife and then done that to herself afterwards. And he explained that theory when police arrived on scene. Oh, what a... I... Arriving home to find a stranger hanging in your garage? Can you... Don't imagine that, but like... I cannot. Like, what? That's... You would see that on TV, like on a crazy TV show and be like, that's... That's, That would never happen. That's too much. No. It was an unbelievable scene to walk into for any party. Yeah. But once investigators did, they immediately had questions. Oh. While Chris Little was convinced he knew what happened, trained investigators felt that there was something off here, not only with his story, but also with the crime scene. Hmm. Because the first thing that raised eyebrows on scene was the fact that Chris had no idea who this woman was. That seemed very likely. Yeah. Or excuse me, it seemed very unlikely. unlikely yes. Yeah. And the way she was found also raised some eyebrows because the woman was discovered not only with a rope around her neck, but around her ankles as well. Huh. That's pretty unusual in a typical case of suicide. Yeah. Then they found out that the relationship between the two dead women, excuse me, and Chris Little was also incredibly complicated. 
and that this woman in the garage wasn't necessarily the stranger that Chris had made her out to be. Ooh. Within hours, his story was starting to crumble, and he and investigator, or his story was starting to crumble around him, excuse me, I can't talk about all that. <laughs> and investigators were pretty sure that this man who had, quote unquote, stumbled upon this scene and called 911, he was their killer, Oh. They now let's get back to the 911 call. It came in from 95 Larkin Avenue in Markham at 3.25 a.m. again on February 12th, 2007. And the York Regional Police and paramedics were on the scene within seven minutes. They were ready to go. First on the scene was Constable Michael Mulville. And when he arrived, he discovered the body of Paula Menendez in the garage. Only she wasn't hanging from the rafters anymore. Her body was laid halfway in the back seat of Chris Little's SUV. What? The SUV had been partially backed into the garage and was still actually running when the officers arrived, which, you know, made sense because he had gotten seen home, stumbled upon the scene, scene, got out of the car, ran home. Okay, I can see why the yeah. car's still running. Sure. Mulville noted that Menendez's lips and skin were blue and her eyes were dilated. Direct quote. When he checked for a pulse, there was none to be found. And as he continued searching through the garage in the exterior of the home, his partner, Constable Stephanie Hunter, was inside. Hunter immediately found Christopher Little standing at the top of the stairs, still actually on the phone with 911. But once he saw that the police had arrived, he hung up uh, with the dispatcher and led Constable Stephanie Hunter to the bed, bedroom excuse me, where 33-year-old Julie Crocker was. He told the officer that he had actually moved Julie from the bed to the floor and had attempted CPR at the 911 dispatcher's request. So okay. when he got home, she was actually on the bed oh, when he okay. discovered her. And then he moved her to the floor to do CPR. Okay. He also let this officer know that their two young daughters were home and had been during the murder. Murders. Oh, my God. Luckily... The children were taken from the home quickly before they were able to see anything. It doesn't appear that they woke up at any time during this. Do you know how old they were? They were younger. I want to say that they were like two and four. Oh, so like little. They were little, little girls. Um, But luckily they didn't see anything and they were young enough to the point where they didn't really understand what was happening. Yeah, because they were and they were sleeping, it seems like. And they were sleeping, yep. They were taken to stay with Julie's relatives until the detectives could figure out everything with Chris. Okay. Now, once the scene was surveyed, the detectives sat down with him and wanted to get his whole story. Yeah. Chris told them that he and his wife were actually in the process of getting divorced. Red flag number one. Oh, yeah. And that they were sharing the home where she'd been discovered. He arrived home just before 3.30 that morning and immediately discovered Paula, though again, he said he, said he did not know this woman by name. Okay. He said that he once he found her, he cut her down in an attempt to revive her, and that was why she was laid in the back seat when police arrived. Okay. When he was unable to revive her, he said he ran inside and found his wife, called 911, attempted CPR as he was instructed to do so, and they knew the rest. When asked again if he was sure that he did not know who this woman in the garage was, he told the investigators no, he did not. The story was strange. Yeah. Why would he start reviving a stranger before he knew that his wife, estranged or not, and two little kids were okay? Yeah. You found this woman in your garage, and you're immediately like, oh, let me tend to this woman who I don't know, who I don't know why she's here and what's going on. But my wife and children are in the house. And let me not check on them, but take care of this first. Yeah. That, I'm sorry, that's not going to be your first that instinct. That wouldn't be my first instinct, I can tell you that. I don't think that would be many people's no. first instinct. I think... Most people would run into the home and make sure that their family was okay. Yeah, I would say so. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. But according to the Canadian Criminal Code, investigators had to obtain a warrant before they searched the house and carried out a forensic analysis on the victims. So while they waited, they sat up a, uh, set up a command post nearby and they continued questioning Chris. He only explained more about the living situation and how he and Julie were sharing the home during their separation as they both kind of figured out where to go separately. Mm -hmm. From the sounds of it, it seems like whoever had the kids stayed at home with them to kind of keep their routine normal. Okay. While the other person stayed at an apartment or, in Julie's case, possibly with her boyfriend, Rick. Okay. Now, once they obtained the search warrant to search Chris and Julie's home, they found out the identity of the woman in the garage officially, 34-year-old Paula Menendez. They would soon learn 
that she was actually somewhat connected to Julie and Chris. Paula, and this is a little convoluted, so Paula was the ex-wife of Julie Crocker's new boyfriend, Rick Ralph. Okay. Got it? Yep. So was what Chris was saying true? Had Paula, in some kind of fit of rage or jealousy, broke into Julie and Chris's home to exact her revenge on Julie? And then because she was so distraught, ended her own life in the garage? Probably not. Police had seen crazier scenarios play out, but still, something about this situation was telling them instinctually to look harder into Chris. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess I could see that being the case, they were thinking, but something yeah. about it was just too messy. Yeah, it's like you can sit there and say, yeah, like that is a, that scenario has played out probably billions of times. Yeah, in some way, shape, or form. In some kind of way, some kind of roundabout way. Mm -hmm. But like, the, even just listening to that scene Far from from over here, I'm like, um, I don't know about that. Yeah. And just his reactions are bothering me. They're strange. Yeah. They will only get stranger. Oh, good. So the more and more they learned about the victims as the morning went on, because this is literally all happening within the day that these two bodies are found. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip those trips to the grocery store, you know that none of us are doing that anymore, and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable, which is why it's America's number one meal kit. Let's talk about the new year, guys. I know that you have new goals, and HelloFresh is here, they're holding your hand, and they're gonna help you achieve those goals. Don't go to the grocery store, take control of your time, take control of your budget, and do so with delicious recipes that are literally dropped off on your doorstep. If you're looking for an easy way to eat well and also save money this year, you can cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and just get started with HelloFresh. You're going to love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant quality meal right in your own kitchen. The other day I got mine delivered and I was like, woohoo, new year, new me. Just kidding. Still cooking this HelloFresh because that's how much I love it. Me and Drew the other night made the winner winner chicken orzo dinner. First of all, that's kind of like a pun, so it speaks to my soul. And second of all, it melts in your GD mouth. I'm a sucker for orzo. And it had a zucchini tomato medley on the side that was melt in your mouth delicious and oh so easy to prepare. I love that they lay out the steps one by one for you. There's literally no way to get confused. Go to hellofresh.com slash morbid21 and use code morbid21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash morbid21 and use code morbid21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. America's number one one meal kit. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Let's be honest, when you're at your best, you can do great things, but also let's be honest. Sometimes life gets you bogged down and you might start to feel overwhelmed or like you're just not showing up in the ways that you want to. But you know what can help? working with a therapist. It'll help get you closer to the best version of yourself. Because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. Let me tell you from personal experience, uh, that is the truth. When I'm in therapy, I am operating at my highest level. I am getting things done. I am communicating with my partner. I am communicating with the people I work with. I'm just operating at a high level. And I feel better. I feel like I'm like, yes, I can do this. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's can convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com morbid today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash morbid. So they're learning more and more, interviewing Jeez. more and more. And the more validated they started to feel in their suspicions of Chris as the day went on. Though Paula and Rick had ended their marriage, they learned that things ended pretty amicably. And it was actually Paula who had initiated the divorce months earlier. Oh, wow. She wasn't happy that things had ended how they had, but she knew that it was the right decision for the both of them. Julie and Chris had also ended their marriage a few months before. And Chris was telling the detectives that their split was also amicable, but the police weren't so sure. And while they were learning more and more about the people involved in this case, they were only coming up with more questions. Mm -hmm. Number one, why would Paula, who initiated a divorce from her husband, 
only become jealous and violently arrange, uh, enraged when he started dating Julie, if she yeah. was the one to initiate the divorce. Two, why would she tie her own feet together before hanging herself? Yeah, and that would make it hard. And more importantly, why wasn't she covered in blood if she had just cut a woman's throat? Yeah. There was not a single drop of blood found on Paula. Yeah. Not a single drop. Three, one of the weirdest aspects of all of this, what was Chris Little doing at his estranged wife's home at three o'clock in the morning? If it was her time to be at the house, what the hell was he doing there at witching hour? Yeah. Why that's was he a, that's there? A, that's a, possibly the best point. He's Why the, the hell one, were you just showing up? He's the one sitting there saying, like, we split our time with the yeah. kids and, and share the house. You arrived at three o'clock in the morning. And we'll get into later and what he says he sleeping. was doing. His explanation, I'm not even going to tell it to you right now. I got to wait until we get there, makes no fucking sense. Yeah, I bet it doesn't. And that whole entire morning, the way that he tries to reason it out, I'm like, you're cooked. <laughs> Anyways, number four, Julie and Chris's two children were home at the time, but other than telling the responding officer that they were there, he made no attempt to check on them himself. And we That's know this. That's what's wild to me. We know this. Since both girls were home, one would think that they would have woken up from hearing some kind of a struggle and would have gone to their father when he got home, or that when he arrived, he would have checked on them. I just, I would have, the first thing I would have done is check on the kids. Absolutely. That would have been the first thought. As if a something is awry instinct, in your home, your first thought should be go to your kids. And even if it's not your first thought, like that's Which questionable. Which is wild to me. <laughs> but, you know, maybe you check on your wife first, then you find her in that state and you still don't go check on your children. Yeah, none of that makes sense. If this stranger broke into your home to exact some kind of revenge on you and your wife... Would she not also exact that revenge with your children? Maybe. But, like, you got to go check on them. Yeah, you got to go find out. Well, we know neither of those things happened because everything that happened in the house from the time Chris called 911 is recorded. Everything. Everything. You can hear the dog barking. You can hear Officer Hunter's arrival. You can hear the paramedics discussing Julie's state. Not once did a child wake up and not once was a child checked on until the officers got there and did it themselves. Jesus. So with all that being said, the primary theory in detectives' minds was that Chris Little had kidnapped Paula and brought her back to he and Julie's home where he then killed both women and staged the scene to make it look like a murder-suicide. Holy shit. How fucking bonkers that's so complex and the thought was that he was so enraged about his wife moving on to rick ralph that he was taking both women from rick jesus mm -hmm. and the theory was only supported by the fact that there was a crumpled up photo of julie and rick found next to julie's body what mm -hmm. which you could see that being like his being the angry ex-wife being the angry ex-wife absolutely or him being the angry estranged husband it goes either way yeah but it also goes it plays right into like he staged this of course because that's fucking ridiculous yeah there was a secondary theory that chris had intended to actually kill rick and had gone to his home to kill him wow. but didn't realize that rick didn't live there anymore and when he found paula he just kind of like switched gears. Wow. I wow. lean more toward the first theory. Yeah, honestly, I lean more towards that too. I think this was his plan all along was to get Paula and make it look like she had done this. That's what I think. I don't think, I think he was trying to hurt Rick and I think he was trying to hurt these two women. Yeah, because I think it was his perfect scenario, which is like Everyone you said, loses. hurt Rick, but also make it so that it's a totally outside scenario from him. And he and gets again, off scot -free. Like you said, everybody loses. Exactly. So either way, the very same day that Chris called 911 and everything had been discovered, detectives were actually able to get a warrant for his arrest. And that afternoon, he was arrested on two counts of first-degree murder. Wow. I bet he never saw that coming so quickly. Sure did Thought he had wrapped all that up. Yeah. He hadn't at all. No. And just wait until you hear the shit that was found. And oh, like, boy. I mean, the fact that Paula didn't have any blood on her at all, how did yeah. you think... How did you not think that through? I mean, and I'm glad like, you didn't, yeah. but... And also, it's, this is just such a wild scenario wild like two women like what the fuck is wrong with you and these are young women they yeah. were 33 and 34 and like at least one of them is a mother yep. to young children mm -hmm. like the mother of your young children like yeah. what the fuck is wrong with you what are you doing what are you God, doing chris watts 
Seriously. Yeah. Fuck this, Chris. Fuck this, Chris, and fuck Chris Watts. But the plan, the plan didn't really work. So at least there's that. And as Chris was being arrested outside of the home, neighbors actually stood by watching in shock. And according to a Globe and Mail article, quote, one resident was overheard telling a neighbor, I moved from Scarborough to get away from this crap. Oof. I'm like, I love that that's Sorry. what's on your mind. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Like, how dare we? Wow. Now, before we get into the rest of the nitty gritty, I did obviously want to touch on both victims' lives before they were taken by this abominable man. Yeah. Chris and Julie had been married for 10 years before this. Oh my God. And had actually pretty much known each other their entire lives because they, bro- they both grew up in Markham, oh which God. is a city in Ontario. We're in Canada. Uh, Chris had grown up on a dairy farm, and his father, Barry, actually used that farm to operate his small dairy business. Chris's family was pretty close-knit. They were super involved in the community. And Julie Crocker also grew up in a close-knit family. She was one of three children to parents Judy and Jim, and she was super close with her two sisters, Stephanie and Jill. And then together, they were all super close with their cousins and extended family. During the summers, the sisters would spend months in Vermont with their aunt, uncle, and cousins. I love this. It sounds like our family, like how close we all are with like cousins and everything. Julie had started dating Chris in high school. They were both students at Markham District High. And when they both graduated, Julie went off to the University of Western Ontario. But they actually stayed a couple while she was at college and made things work long distance. When she was finished with college, she and Chris married in 1997. And for a while, they both just wanted to separate, uh, focus on their separate careers. Julie got a job in 2002 with Rogers Media, which was a, and is a Toronto-based sports media and brand consultancy. Mm-hmm. And she worked in ad sales. One year later, in 2003, she became a mom and the couple became parents to their first daughter. And a year later, they would have a second daughter. In addition to all of that, Julie and Chris were also very involved volunteers for the Markham Fair, which used to be organized by Chris's father, Barry. So this has like such a small town feel to it. It really does. It's one of the country's oldest fairs, actually. And Julie was so dedicated to everything she could do for it. Everyone remembered her in every aspect of life as, quote, a devoted, diligent, and hardworking team player who touched so many lives in so many ways. They said whether it was getting through school, raising her two children, or the volunteer work she did, she gave everything her all. And Paula Menendez was also from Markham and had grown up there. She'd actually originally been born in Argentina and had a twin sister, Carolina, as well as an older sister, Claudia. Their parents were Monica and Jamie Menendez, and their family was also incredibly close. Monica and Jamie actually wanted to move their family to Canada while the kids were still so young to escape the violence going on in Argentina. Wow. Which only makes this case all the more tragic. Paula and Julie had drive as a commonality. After Paula graduated from college, she got a job as a physiotherapist and went on to work for Pivot Physiotherapy Clinic. All of her coworkers were obsessed with her. Like, she was beloved to everybody's life that she touched. They said she was not only a skilled worker, but a wonderful person who, quote, loved to laugh. She loved jokes, and she had a laugh that was completely infectious. Oh, it's just... This always makes me so sad. So senseless. Yeah. Like, the... These two murders. It really is. These were both, like, beautiful, involved in their community. Bright, kind, caring, Like, would have gone on to do such incredible things because they already had been doing incredible things. Yeah, exactly. Now, it was in 2003 that Paula got married, and she met and got married to Rick Ralph, but their relationship had issues from the jump. After just two months of being married, they were already growing apart, And Rick had actually already started an affair with a woman at work. The affair went on for years. And by 2005, Paula and Rick were in couples therapy, desperately trying to make things work and doing their best to save their marriage. Oh, boy. It took about a year of trying, but they really weren't making much headway. And things weren't in a desirable place. So a a heartbroken Paula suggested that they separate. And by the fall of 2006, they were officially divorced. She was really sad about it. And he was too, but I, for her, it was like, he was cheating on her first yeah. of all. And she was like, I don't want to be in a marriage with somebody that doesn't want to be here. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to keep him here if he doesn't want to be here. Yeah, I would I love to be her. here and I would love to be a part of this marriage, but not in this state. Yeah, of course. I understand that. 
So they split amicably, like I said, and they still seem to have love for each other. I think it was one of those things where they loved each other, but they weren't in love anymore. Yeah. But the divorce hit Paula harder than she actually thought it would. Her dream in life was to get married, start her own family, and open her own physiotherapy business. And now in some ways, she was back to square one. But Paula wasn't one to let life beat her down, and she knew she was still young and had plenty of time to achieve the goals she'd set for herself. Yeah. And in the months leading up to her death, she actually was starting to date again, kind of starting to get out there, trying her best to move on. Getting her groove back. And just before she was killed, she actually got a new tattoo to kind of represent this change in her life. She got a butterfly that was supposed to signify her new beginning and how strong and resilient she was. Metamorphosis. Just like a butterfly. I love that. Now you have a Hillary Duff song stuck in my head. There you go. Now heading back into the investigation, the shit's going to get wilder and wilder as we go. As the pathologist examined Paula's body, it was clear that she had not taken her own life as Chris Little intended to make it look. Dr. Toby Rose listed Paula's uh, cause of death as ligature strangulation. Oh, meaning somebody else had placed the rope around Mm -hmm. her neck. In his report, Dr. Rose noted that the position of the ligature mark on Paula's neck suggested that she'd been strangled, saying, quote, in a classical self-hanging, a ligature mark is higher up under the chin rather than straight across the voice box. Because the gravity pulls you down. Exactly. Which was where the mark on Paula was found, straight across her voice box. Yeah, that, does, that literally, like, physics doesn't make sense Exactly. There. She had very clearly been killed yeah. before she was hanged from those rafters, which is... So dark. Horrific. So dark. And there were a multitude of bruises on her body, all over her hands and wrists, the back of her legs and thighs, suggesting oh that she'd been handled quite aggressively. Dr. Rose's conclusion was that she'd been murdered and the scene was staged. There was no question, obviously, as to how Julie Crocker died, but the pathologist still had to carry out an examination of her body, too. It's just the way things yeah, go. Yeah, of course. It was confirmed that her cause of death was an over 10-inch long, quote, deep, ragged, and irregular cut to the neck, which started near her left ear and ended near her right collarbone. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Rose said the cut was so deep that there was, quote, really only skin left uncut at the back of the neck. She was nearly decapitated. Like, he literally just didn't get the skin in the back. Oh, my God. He said that there was, quote, extensive damage to the trachea, internal muscles and cartilage, the carotid artery and jugular vein, and both lobes of the thyroid gland, the esophagus, and even the cervical vertebrae. Wow. Like, he... What did he use? A jagged knife. Oh, like a hunting a knife. jagged knife. My God. And in addition to her throat being slashed, there were also superficial wounds to the left side of her face and defensive sharp force injuries to her face, to her neck, and to her hands. My God. This was brutal yeah. for both women. When the forensic te- technicians processed the crime scene, there was not much evidence found within the home. The detectives knew by this point that the scene had been staged, But actually, the lack of blood evidence outside of the bedroom where Julie had been discovered only proved their point more. So it was kind of beneficial that there wasn't blood everywhere. Absolutely. And it's like he lives in this house part-time. Exactly. So it's like it would be hard. And has for years and years and years. He knows this place. I just happened to look up pictures of them because I like to see who. Beautiful. Beautiful. And there's a picture of them on their wedding day. And I'm just looking at it and I'm like, how does that, how does that go from that to that? My brain can't compute this kind of stuff where like you marry someone no, and then this hat, like never. I think about that so much more now, especially like planning a wedding because so much love goes into that and like excitement and preparation and you stand before that person and choose them forever, no matter what. And that's, and then like you have babies together yeah, and this like, and this isn't like crime of passion which is he just the a moment. scary this like planned and this is like brutal almost decapitation like this is how do you do that to someone that you love oh he did i don't understand that he did terrible things to this woman oh, even boy. in life oh good terrible terrible things he was not a husband no i mean obviously. not a husband at all yeah it's ridiculous but the lack of blood in this case was helpful because had paula been the one to murder julie that savagely like i was saying earlier and then gone out to the garage one would assume that there would be at least a little bit of blood on the path out to the garage and paula would have been covered yeah like i said she was not covered in blood and there was 
no blood evidence found in the garage. Yeah, no. The only blood evidence outside of the bedroom came from handprints that were left by Chris after he'd attempted CPR. Yeah, none of that makes sense. No, it makes no sense. Now, luckily, inside of the garage, there was some evidence left behind by the killer. There were fragments of the rope used to hang Paula still left on the rafters. And on the floor near where her body was, there was a pair of black gloves next to a knife, which was the one used to kill Julie. Remember those black gloves. Okay. It was more what they didn't find that helped the investigators. Chris was trying to say Paula had killed his wife in a jealous rage, but she didn't even look like she'd left her house intentionally or with any kind of plan. She actually looked like she'd left her home unexpectedly. She was found wearing track pants, a hoodie, and boots, and a scarf, but no underwear. And she also had none of her personal belongings with her. No wallet, no keys, no cell phone, not even her car. So how did she get there? Wow. Not even her car, I say to you again. They're trying, he's seriously trying to pass this off. How did she get there? With that major, major flaw. She didn't bring her keys, her wallet, her cell phone, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. That makes sense. But unfortunately, over at Paula's uh, apartment, there really wasn't much evidence to find. There were no footprints, no tire tracks that they could have tested against Chris Little. And there was really nothing in her home to indicate a struggle, which is interesting. Mm. However, there was evidence to suggest that somebody had left in a hurry, it seemed. There was an unpacked bag of clothes in the master bedroom. Paula's purse and her cell phone were found on the main floor. And in the basement, they found a, quote, still damp wash in the washing machine, as if somebody had just thrown it on with the intention of switching it over. Yeah. And Paula's car was found in the driveway. And interestingly... The word suffer was found scratched onto its hood. What? Yeah. Oh, How creepy is that? Oh, that's so it's creepy. Like, was he, I don't know if Chris was planning on doing something else with her car and then like forgot or what. Yeah. But it's like he did that clearly. Wow. Weird. That's weird. Weird as hell. Yeah. Like what was the thought process there? I don't know if it was like he realized that it didn't make sense and uh, and just left her car there or what. And it's like they're going to find that. Like, of course they are. They're going to go to her home. you're an idiot. So throughout the search of Paula's home, investigators also found her diary, which contradicted Chris's theory that she was an enraged, jealous lover. I'm not going to read directly from it. There are quotes out there, but I don't want to read directly from somebody's diary if that feels weird. Yeah, I feel that. But the diary painted a picture of a woman who was reacting completely appropriately to the end of a relationship. In early October, Paula wrote about losing Rick and how hard that was. In the following weeks, though, the entry or in the following weeks, the entries were similar. But however, by January, which was about four months after they split up, she seemed hopeful. And she wrote that there were, of course, moments of sadness, but that she was starting to feel better and really didn't have the same longing that she had. Yeah. And it's like very normal going through it. This is her diary. If she's jealous, she's going to write about Julie Crocker. She's going to write how pissed off she is. She's going to write, fuck this woman, like all this stuff. Of course she is. Not one entry found like that at all. And it's like, this is just normal, like, I'm going through it. And here's my thoughts. And here's the grief process. Yeah, exactly. I'm feeling better. Exactly. She even wrote about how she'd started dating again. Yeah. Paula was a future-oriented person. She wasn't obsessed with the past. No. Even in her most private and personal moments, she wasn't showing any signs of being jealous and hadn't even mentioned Julie and Rick's relationship. Yeah, so she's just moving on. Now, among some of the more damning evidence found and sent off to the technical technological crimes unit was Chris Little's work computer. Oh, boy. Just two days before Julie and Paula were killed, Chris made a search for Paula's home address on his computer. Hmm. Why would you do that? My he God. also looked up photos and saved one of a banner for Paula's home-based clinic, all-in-one physiotherapy. And saved an image of a MapQuest route to Paula's home. What the fuck? Yeah. These were all found on like the temporary image cache part of the computer for my techies out there. Yeah. Can't delete that shit. Can't. Forever. Nothing is deleted forever. The cloud exists. I don't even know where it is. Just gotta ask Casey Anthony. Yeah. Ugh. Now, this next bit of evidence is fucking wild. After interviewing Rick, Ralph, and friends connected to each victim, investigators learned that Chris Little had been testing Julie's clothes for semen using a 
it's called a checkmate infidelity kit. Are you fucking kidding me? No, I'm for real. Evidence was found from the kit in the basement of Julie and Chris's home. And along with it, this is a trigger warning for sexual assault. They found, quote, a wireless pinhole camera and a digital video that showed Mr. Little apparently sexually assaulting an unconscious Julie Crocker. What? He was sexually assaulting his wife and had at least one video of it. She's unconscious in the video. And this is like well before the murders? Yep. Like just in their lives? Just, this is what he's doing? Yep. He What the fuck? He must have drugged her and done this to her. And I'm sorry if you do that once. That's not the only time you've done that. No, of course it's not. Had they been able to look for more, which they weren't and able to. And if that's to, the only time you did that. No matter what. Yeah. Bye. Get the fuck out of here. Like you need to be behind bars. That's like, what, what they the found. Fuck? And they found it in the in the ceiling of the basement, like hidden away. Oh my God. This guy's a fucking monster. He, have you seen him? Yeah. Yeah. He looks like a monster. He does look like a yeah. monster. His insides very much reflect on the outside. Oh wild oh my god that's awful and rick told investigators that yes he was very much involved with julie they'd been dating for a few months at that point and they spent a lot of time at his apartment after she separated from chris like i said i think she spent nights there when it was chris's turn to use their house yeah of course which she's allowed to do they're yeah, separated of course. and she doesn't have an apartment yet so no that, where else is she gonna go yeah Rick said that Chris hadn't exactly acted threateningly toward Julie when he was there. Like, he never saw any instance of that. But he did seem to pop up pretty much any time Rick and Julie were out together. Mm. Anywhere they went, Chris also seemed to be there. One night when they were spending the night at Julie's home, Rick actually woke up to Chris shaking his feet in their bedroom. Like, him and Julie are asleep in her bedroom. And Chris comes in the house and wakes Rick out up by shaking his feet. Shaking his feet? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, Rick didn't wait around to find out what the hell Chris was doing and why he was there. He simply gathered up his stuff and got out of there. Yeah, I don't believe Which that reaction says a lot. Yeah. That says, I am i don't want to deal with this man. I know where this is going. I've yeah. probably dealt with this before or something similar, and I'm not doing it tonight. Well, and he probably knew there's kids in the house. And I'm, and I'm not, not going to create a disruption. Create this huge disruption in the middle of the night because this guy's a crazy person. Exactly. He then dropped another bomb on investigators. He and Julie had gone on vacation together in St. Lucia. I think that's how you say yep. that. Yeah. And shortly before their trip, Julie found a GPS tracker on her car. What the fuck? She believed, obviously, that Chris Little had put it there, which explained how he was popping up everywhere she went oh with God. Rick. He was stalking them. Yeah. And stalking her. Chris's own therapist said that Chris had told her the day Julie and Rick left on their trip to go to St. Lucia was, quote, the worst day of his life and later testified about that in court. Wow. So for him to say that he was, he later says that like it, it was fine that she moved on and no. she made her choice. And, you no. know, while I'm so upset about it, I respect her decisions no. and la di da do. It's like, no, you didn't. No, no, you, you definitely didn't. You were didn't. checking her clothes for semen, first of all. Which, what the fuck? I didn't even know that was a thing. It shouldn't be. Like infidelity kits, that's like, get too out much of here. for me. Like if if you're at that point, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not it, worth exactly. it anymore. Exactly. You've sexually assaulted her and videoed it and then hid it in your own home. And now you're showing up wherever she is. I'm just astounded by you're this. Not, you're not over this. You're no, not over this woman. At absolutely all. not. Not at all. In the most unhealthy way one could be. Literally. It's ridiculous that he would even claim that. No. Ugh. So detectives leaning more into their investigation of Chris then attempted to track his movements on the night of the 911 call leading up to it. This is where things really get interesting. They were able to find surveillance footage from a gas station off of Highway 407, not far from their home. He's at the gas station at 2 a.m., 80 minutes before he placed the 911 call. And interestingly enough, he's seen wearing black gloves that looked identical to the ones found at the scene. Oh, and he's deep cleaning his car. Oh. At 2 a.m. As mm. one does. Yeah, that's usually when you do that. And the footage along with all 
all the other evidence that we've gone over led them to being pretty confident that Chris Little was their man. Yeah. He wasn't ready to accept that his marriage was over and wasn't willing to let anyone have Julie if he couldn't. And Paula, unfortunately, seemed to be collateral damage. Yeah, I think it was just a more a punishment for Rick and just, again, a a piece to the puzzle that he thought he could get out of this. Exactly. It was his way out of this. It was a double whammy. Yep. Now, luckily, like I said, he was arrested the same day this happened, and he was arrested on two counts of first-degree murder, and the pretrial phase began on April 27, 2009. The judge overseeing the case did have some qualms with some of the evidence found, unfortunately. Huh. Justice uh, Michelle First claimed that Chris Little's rights had been violated when the York Regional Police searched the basement of the home where they found the video of Chris assaulting Julie. I'm sorry, this stuff goes up my ass. It does. I it goes up my ass too. It's legal shit and it's, con- you know, constitution and all that stuff and your yeah. rights and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, I'm sorry. And it, from the sounds of it, it was basically a technicality. I don't know if it was that the search warrant didn't, didn't include, include the, basement, the basement, but they had a warrant to search the house. Yeah. So the basement's part of the house. And this man is drugging and assaulting his wife and videotaping it. I think we can go, you know what? <laughs> yeah. That was probably good that we found that. Yeah. But uh, she she wouldn't let it in the And court. I know that stuff. Like, no one needs to explain it. It's fine. I understand what the whole thing is. I get it. It's yeah, fine. yeah, totally. Whatever. It's like, we get it. But it's it just like, sucks. But I'm just saying, it sucks. Looking like, at it from yeah. not a law point of from view. From an emotional point of view. It sucks because now jurors yeah. weren't going to know anything about this video's existence. And that's bullshit because that is very much who he is as a person. And, and a it huge- should be in involved in his trial and a huge part of this case yeah if he's capable of drugging and sexually assaulting his own wife and videotaping it then he is very much capable of murdering her and i think that should be included thank you but i I understand that it can't because law i get it yeah 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 so (laughs) unfortunately she also would not allow interview testimony from several of paula's friends commenting on how optimistic she was in the weeks leading up to her death The judge's ruling on this matter was with the defense when they argued that Paula made those comments to individuals who, quote, were not someone with whom she had a history of discussing personal matters. So basically, because the prosecution couldn't prove that Paula had deep conversations about her feelings with these people in the past, there was no way to prove that she was being truthful when she made positive comments. That one is a whole bunch of bullshit, in my opinion. (laughs) That, that's a wild one it's just like yeah that's weird. really around the yeah i don't I mean, know all right like okay sure cool so the jury selection was finished by late september of 2009 remember this happened in 2007 this oh, has been wow. going on at this point for two years damn and the trial started on the 23rd of september same year the co-prosecutor for the crown michael demser i believe that's how you say it i did look it up I'm hoping I'm saying it right. He laid out his case in opening arguments, telling the jury that Christopher Little killed his wife out of jealousy and then killed Paula to frame her for Julie's murder. He explained Chris could not accept that his marriage was over, wouldn't accept that Julie had moved on, and he presented evidence to, to the jury showing that Chris had been spying on Julie for several months and had been tracking her movements with her new boyfriend, Rick Ralph. He was also able to find out, and this was perfect, he was able to find out and tell the jury that Julie had been planning on fully moving out of the home during her last days, and actually, in the days leading up to her murder, had been looking at apartments. Oh. So he argued that Julie's independence and this step to move even further from her strange uh, strange husband was the event that launched Chris into full-blown panic and planning mode, and his plan was to kill her so she couldn't get away from him. I could see that. Boom. The prosecution's private theory was that Chris kidnapped Paula to murder her in the home and make it look like she was the one to kill Julie because of the jealousy, la di da do. But Demser knew he could prove that, and he knew he could prove this to the jury based on all the evidence, but he also knew that this was a bit of a confusing story to digest and that the jury might find the plot convoluted. Yeah. So he was like, you know, I'm not sure if that's the way I want to go. I so It's so crazy that you have to think about that in these scenarios. Yeah. Like the jury might not be able to handle 
the actual story. Right. So we have to come up with like we a, kinda have a more to... palatable way to give it to them. Right. Because if there's a reasonable doubt going on, yeah. then we have fucked. to think about that. Right. So instead of speculating on Chris's intentions or even his state of mind, he just wanted the jury to focus on evidence. Mm -hmm. And he told them, quote, the police found a crumpled photograph of her with Rick Ralph kissing in front of a pool in St. Lucia. Chris's therapist will testify that Chris told her the day Julie left for St. Lucia was the worst day of his life. Yeah. Later that day, Rick Ralph was called to testify for the prosecution, and he told the jury about all of the times where Chris showed up while he and Julie were out with one another. He was able to talk about that GPS tracker that Julie had found on her car and that she knew was put there by Chris. So overall, the prosecution was pretty successful in attempting to prove their case. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know the defense yeah. still had their chance. Of course. John Rosen was Chris Little's defense attorney, and he told the jury that Chris had been at his own home watching movies on the night of the murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty unfortunate for him because his TV cannot work his, his alibi. Like, his TV's not going to sit there and be like, yeah, he was at home watching me. They can't? There's, there's no they one. They couldn't get it in there? No, they couldn't. No. There's no one there to prove that alibi yeah. except for you. And I'm just going to sit here and believe that? And, and I bet in his mind, it's like, well, nobody can prove this, but nobody can disprove it either. Exactly. Yeah. He thought he was being sly yeah. there. The only reason the lawyer said that Chris had even gone to the house in the first place, this is ridiculous. Absolutely fucking ridiculous was because he needed some clothes for a work trip that he was going on the next morning. You know, because 3 a.m. is a pretty normal time to pack your bag at your estranged wife's house, even though you have the entire rest of the day to do so. Wow. He just had to go there at 3 a.m. to clean Yeah, clothes. absolutely. Yeah, that makes total sense. And he also argued that his client had been on surveillance. Surveillance. I can never say that right. I know. It is hard to say. It is. He argued that that's, he had been on the surveillance cleaning the car because he was really just being thoughtful. Julie was to use the car later that day, and Chris just wanted to make sure it was nice and tidy for just her. Just being a good estranged husband. So he was just like, you know what, let me go clean this car at 2 a.m. I just finished yeah. my movie. I think that's a great way to do. Yeah. Yeah, You because everybody cleans their fucking car at 2 in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. He argued that Paula was the real killer and that she was, quote, a desperate, jealous wife who killed her rival and then in despair hanged herself. Wow. He focused on Paula's diary, which was an interesting choice, because he said there was evidence within it that showed that Paula was, quote, tormented by a failed relationship with a philandering husband. And he told the jurors that they might hear that Paula was moving on and maybe she was optimistic, optimistic, but really she was, quote, in crisis and in turmoil. And that the reason people thought she was being happy just came down to her ability to put on a happy face. Wow. Yeah, totally. <laughs> he said the happy face was how she was able to go out and drink with her friends and party before she, quote, came home to the reality of her empty home on the day of the murders. And then was basically trying to say, like, she had gone out partying and drinking. She came home. She was upset. She was alone. And she thought, you know what? Let me go kill my husband's girlfriend, my ex-husband's wow. new girlfriend. Like, that is... It's so vile that they put these things on. It is. Like, it's so vile. And I understand, like, you have a job to do, but sometimes the lengths that people will go to, you're yeah. like, oh, You're just like, how do you... I, and I, I, again, I get it, but it's a, like, it's a job. You got to do your job. But I it's think like, there's a certain way to go about it without well, defiling like, a dead human's and reputation. And I, just me personally, could not get in the headspace to do that. So I could no. not do that job. No, I feel like I would be haunted. Yeah, I just got, I don't think my brain would be able to, like, formulate that. No, correctly. I don't think so either. It just wouldn't. Same here. Yeah. So the next week of the trial was where the jurors heard testimony from first responders and from family and friends of both victims. Responding officers Michael Mulville and Stephanie Hunter testified about the crime scene, while the jury was also presented with photos of both women, which showed how they were discovered. Oh, God. I can't imagine having oh. to see that. Co-prosecutor Douglas Casco walked the jury through the details of each scene, telling them how there was only a small amount of blood on the inner and outer doorknobs of the bedroom door, which led him to believe that whoever had killed Julie did this because they wanted to minimize any noise so as not to wake up the children. Oh. He emphasized that the door was closed to prevent the kids from seeing their mother, which would have been the act of a person who cared about the kids and not the act of an enraged murderer. No. He also asked them to think about the lack of blood found on Paula's body. Not a single drop anywhere. But the defense wanted them to believe that she had cut a woman's throat nearly to the point of decapitation and Makes got sense. out of that 
with not a literal single drop of blood on her. Yeah. I can't even stress that point enough because it's fucking That's, ridiculous. And, and it's like reasonable doubt. To like, the extreme. To the <laughs> like nth degree. Yeah, to another galaxy. Crazy. <laughs> Casco then reminded them, and this is this is one of my favorite parts of this case because it's like you fucked yourself. You thought that you were so, like, above this. You were the mastermind of this all. Mm-hmm. And this little technicality right here, if I was sitting on the jury and heard this, I would have been like, boom. He reminded the jury to think about a 40-second period between Little entering the home from the garage and making it up to the bedroom. In that time, he is on the phone with 911, closes the front door, takes off his shoes, hangs his jacket, then goes upstairs to the bedroom where he found Julie. For one thing, who does that after discovering a hang stranger in their garage? Yeah. And secondly, in those 40 seconds, he told the dispatcher that there was blood all over the place. But he would have said that before he ever entered the bedroom. They timed it. Wow. There was no possible way that when he said there was blood all over the place, that he had actually he'd been even to been the to the bedroom. Oh, So my how God. would he know that if he wasn't the one that killed, killed his what wife? What an actual idiot. Casco asked the jury and then answered the question for them because he killed her. Yeah. He had seen the blood already. If I was sitting on that jury that at it. that point in time, I'd be like, boom, case closed. Yeah. How do you argue with case that? Case closed fucking close how do you argue with that i have no idea because you didn't see any blood in the garage no so you're not talking about that nope nope absolutely fucking ridiculous so ultimately chris's trial went on for two months by the end of those two months the jurors spectators the press heard from a lot of witnesses they heard from responding officers the medical examiner rick ralph paula's family julie's family plenty of people And the testimony proved that Julie was in an unsatisfying, crumbling marriage and took the initiative to change that reality. Yeah. Paula was also ready to change her reality, though she was disappointed about the end of her marriage. She was ready for the future. She was excited to move on. She was excited to complete the goals she'd set for herself. Yeah. And Chris Little was the complete opposite of these two women. He was jilted and he couldn't let go of what was already gone. Nope. So he wanted revenge and in his mind wanted to win. Yeah. But he fucking lost. He lost big time. As the trial neared an end, Chris Little decided to actually take the stand and testify in his own defense. That's usually not a good idea. It was not. He Thankfully, he told the jury that he was innocent and that he and Julie, quote, had all in all a good relationship. We were a good team together. Oh, okay. And then he made it seem like he was the victim in the relationship and focused on Julie's infidelity, saying, quote, I don't blame Julie. She was just not sure what she wanted. And that he, quote, wanted the opportunity to see if we could get past that. But that it was Julie who took the chance away from him when she chose Rick over him. It was as simple as that. He said when when she made her decision, he realized it was over. He accepted that Rick was who she truly wanted to be with. All he wanted going forward was to be amicable co parents and maybe one day even friends. Wow. Let me just play the the world's smallest violin while he testifies. He might have done his best to make himself look like the victim in the situation, but all of the evidence and all of the other testimonies collectively were on the complete contrary to this sweet, wounded angel fucking act of his. No reasonable person would stalk their estranged wife, would place a tracker on her car, would test her clothing for semen, or sexually assault her while she was unconscious. Yeah. Though the jury didn't know about the latter. That's now, so fucked up. In his closing arguments, it is. Chris's lawyer reminded the jury that the Crown's case was built on completely circumstantial evidence and speculation. He told them, there's no smoking gun, and asked, quote, where's the boiling, roiling, I don't know, boiling, roiling is such a stupid thing to say. It is Cauldron stupid. of angst, anger, depression, and humiliation. And finally told the jury that if there was even a hint of reasonable doubt in their minds, that they had an obligation to acquit his client. They don't have it. I don't. I'm I'm predicting here, but they don't have it. I don't have it. Because I don't hear it. No one has it. No. In the prosecution's closing arguments, they acknowledged that, of course, there were lingering questions and some unknowns when it came to this sequence of events that night of the murders. No one had seen anybody coming or going from Paula's home that night. 
They had simply speculated, yes, that it was Chris who kidnapped her, but reminded the jury, quote, he needed someone to blame for the murder of his wife, someone who he mistakenly believed had the same motive for killing his wife. And though their evidence was circumstantial, it was abundant and showed a man who was obsessed and unwilling to let go. So in those closing arguments, Casco actually referenced a letter that Chris had sent Julie a couple weeks before she was killed. The letter was in, in response to people encouraging him to move on and read, quote, To all this I say no. What I am and where I am is totally and completely in love with you. Wow. But I thought you just said that you were willing to let her go. I was just going to say, wait a second. She made her choice. You mm. said it, she chose Rick and you understood and respect that and just hoped that someday you could be friends. You just hoped. But you just sat here and said, no, I won't move on. I'm Where I am is completely and totally in love with you. Yeah, obviously. You're in love with her? No, the fuck you're not. That's I don't know no. what you think love is, but it's not this. That's a no. It's a no for me, it's dog. It's a big old no. It took the jury, interestingly, because I, I, I always love to see how long the jury takes to deliberate. I know, because it's always very telling of how it is. Of how strong that case is. It is. And I understand that this wasn't necessarily a very strong case, because, and, yeah. and so did the prosecution. They said there are still lingering questions. Yeah. So it took the jury actually three days to reach a decision. Oh, wow. It was November 25th, 2009, when they finally did. And they found Christopher Litter, Little might as well be litter yep. guilty on both counts of first degree murder good motherfucker was going to prison bye the verdict was an end to two years of hell uncertainty and an opening of wounds for both of the victims families yeah paula's twin sister carolina told the reporters quote it won't bring paula back and we're going to miss her every single day but chris paid for what he did hell yeah he did and she and her family were satisfied with the jury's decision now, Julie and Paula's loved ones were able to read victim impact statements on November 30th, 2009. And pa this is heartbreaking. Paula's mo mother, Monica, told the court how almost 34 years ago, she and her husband made the decision to leave Argentina and the violence they'd experienced there so that they could give their children a better life. And she said Paula's, question Paula's murder would make her always question that decision. Oh, that breaks my heart. She told the court, quote, Please don't misunderstand me. I still have the same original feeling when I compare it to other countries. But what an irony and disappointment when our beloved Paula would end up paying for her life, paying with her life for a decision I made more than three decades ago. Oh, my God. And no, no. And it's not her That's fault. not what that was. But it's terrible that she has to live every day of the rest of her life because of this motherfucker. Yeah. This little tiny man. And I just want to be like, no, no, no. Like, it's because this fucking worm of a human wiggled his way into her orbit somehow yep. Yep. it had nothing it was like just happenstance yeah truly truly, truly just happen yeah. happenstance it's so true oh and this is even more heartbreaking paula's sister her twin sister carolina told the court how she had been pregnant and had actually gone into labor on the morning of her sister's murder saying quote the ugly truth of it will be that my son's birthday will be a constant reminder of the day my beloved twin was oh murdered. Oh, my God. Like That is heart-wrenching. That is way too much for one family. Way too much for one family. You know what, though? There's this, like, I don't know if it's an old Irish saying. It I is. I think it is. It's like when it's one like a person leaves, another person comes in. And that happened to it's you. It's like you open the door and, yeah, it yeah. happened to us on um, on our side when the girls were born. It's so true. And it's and it's obviously, this is a very different circumstance when it happened yeah. to us. It was not this a brutal murder. No, of course not. And that is very hard to to wrap your brain around. It's just like, but I hope it would provide can, a small comfort. Maybe you can give a little comfort with that. Just like, that, yeah. Oh, it's just there's no way to. There really isn't. No, because this and that's awful. the thing. She's like every year it's I awful. celebrate my child's birthday is also. A reminder that I I lost my sister oh, that day. That just breaks my heart. And I can't imagine giving birth and having that be like one of the most amazing things to happen yeah. in your life and all the hormones coursing throughout your body and then you get the news that this happened to your yeah. your twin sister oh my god like i, I have goosebumps right now yeah. just thinking about it my heart goes so far Truly out to this my family. brain just can't even no to both of these families oh now chris was offered the opportunity to address the the court and no remain one gives silent. a shit what you say yeah, yeah luckily, you should remain silent shut did. the fuck up 
But honestly, he should have fought. I don't like it doesn't matter, but you should have got up and apologized oh, to it's, these families. Yeah, it's a total double edged sword it with is. those things because it's like, I don't want to hear your fucking face hole. Like no. you can shut the fuck up. But the fact but that you the chose same time, not to say anything, you should want to say something. Exactly. But I don't want to fucking hear it. Exactly. <laughs> like it's one of those things where it's like, I want to be invited, but please know I'm not coming. Exactly. Like if you don't invite me, I'm going to be pissed, but I'm definitely not coming. That's yeah. exactly what that is. Exactly. Now, after all the statements were read, Justice Michelle Furst addressed Little and commented on his callousness for robbing his and Julie's two children of a mother, saying, quote, she read him to absolute filth. I love this woman. Because you made them lose both their parents. Yeah. She said, robbing your children of their, their mother's love, you slashed the throat of the woman you professed to love so severely that her head almost came off. Oh. As for Miss Menendez, you saw to it that the pain you inflicted increased a thousandfold when you publicly labeled her a homicidal, (sighs) suicidal maniac day after day in this court. Paula Menendez was truly an innocent player in a production cast and staged by you and you alone. Holy shit. And And that's honestly the part that gets me, too, is like this whole thing is tragic on mm -hmm. every level. But Paula having to... He's sitting there labeling her not just a vicious murderer, Mm -hmm. but a jealous, outrageous, unhinged, just like doesn't care about these people's children, would would steal a mother from these children, would would be this unhinged over a man. Right. A man who she decided to leave because it wasn't working and she left this man amicably and this man was amicable too well this situation was like what you were claiming your situation was and what julie wanted your situation to be and you're sitting here like just running her over the coals with her reputation and it seems like paula like you said the two of them like yeah it didn't end well like that's not a great way to end a marriage no. somebody cheating and the other person no. not wanting to leave but having to mm-hmm. but it sounds like they had come to a place where it was like okay, this happened. And like, we both have love for each other, but we need to move on. Exactly. And it's like, that's the best case scenario in that situation. Absolutely. That's what what I think most divorced couples could hope for. And they were being adults. They were being mature. They were moving on. They seemed like they weren't having this like crazy feud thing going on. And honestly, what a testament to Paula. Exactly. And she's even writing in her diary that like she's going through it, but she's going to come out the other side and that she was feeling good. She never sat there and disparaged Julie. She never sat there and disparaged Rick, it sounds never. like. no. And it's like, so she's this like great person who's mature and healthy and ready to move forward. Yeah, just and focused on the future. And you're painting her as so far the opposite that you can't, it's... Uh, it's just incredible. You're painting incredible. her to be the monster that you are. The literally you take responsibility. That you strangled her with a ligature and then hung her in like uh, and hung her out there in this like horrifying degrading way. Yep. And then further just disparage her character after you brutally murdered her and hung her in like out to out to be a murderer. Like, and not to mention what if your two kids did wake up? What if they saw that? And they you would did that never to your kids. Get through that. That image and that that entire image would be burned in their brains for the rest of their lives. If you can forever do that, changing them as human beings. If you can do that, you're not a father. You're not. It if really, you can no. do that to their mother and you can do that while they're home, absolutely not. And to another innocent woman. And to exactly and then pin it on her. Like, what the fuck? fuck he's a depraved individual when i said abominable i meant abominable it truly just it astounds he really does remind me of chris watts he reminds me of the way that there is clearly no love for those children and no no love for that woman no real pure love for that woman no and to be able to disparage somebody after you have brutally murdered them just like he was able to it's Mm -hmm. like what the fuck is wrong with these men seriously Seriously. Like, get it together. It's funny that you say not funny. It's just ironic that you say that because the whole time I was putting this case together, I kept thinking of Chris Watts. And we've been a lot of people have wanted us to cover Chris Watts. I'm not covering Chris Watts. No, because he likes what he likes cover him. the coverage. And I I can't even look at that case. That and case. What happened in that case? Yeah. I, I read a little bit of it and I will. I'm like forever changed no. by that case. And I can't even think of those children and what that poor woman had to go through. We try not to cover things where children are the victims yeah. a lot of and most that of the is time. just too brutal. That's for me. just something that yeah. is probably not gonna happen. No. 
So after she sentenced Chris to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years, which was the maximum sentence allowed under Canadian law. I was going to say that's stupid. He shouldn't have parole. I know he shouldn't, but Canada. She told him Canada. that he was, quote, cowardly, vicious, and deserving of the most severe punishment that their law permits. Good. So he began serving his sentence at a maximum security prison in Ontario, but he was transferred to a medium security prison in the summer of 2012 when the original prison that he was in was closing down. Both Julie and Paula's families protested and wrote to the Supreme yeah. Court, and they said the move felt like it was a slap in the face to them. Yeah. But they were told that the decision was based on, quote, the degree of control needed to protect the public staff offender and the security of the institution and availability of the appropriate programs and services. It's mm. a technicality. Yeah, I was just going to say that's a very fancy way of saying, like, it's a technicality. Exactly. And no, and they said in no way was it meant to be a reflection of the crimes that he'd committed. Yeah, but it, Which it it's kind like, of is. Though. Where you are should be <laughs> yeah. a reflection of the crimes you committed. Exactly. Ridiculous. He did appeal his conviction in 2014 and argued for a new tri a trial claiming, say it with me, that his rights had been infringed oh. upon. It's like... You can't claim that when the judge actually left evidence out. Of, because, because they felt like, like, yeah. Like, she did her due diligence there. Yeah. The request was denied, and the original sentence was upheld. By rot in prison. Yes. You sick truly. fuck. Because no matter what, I'm assuming that parole will be denied each time. I would think. Up. I mean, come on. I would think. He brutally murdered two women. Including I mean, the mother of his children that he literally almost decapitated on the floor of their bedroom. Yeah, but then you have to think about, like, um, fucking what's-her-face there, Carla Barbie Mocha. and Ken. Yeah, yeah Carla like, Mocha. she's out. That's true. So. But this, that's a little different, It I is guess. a little different, because she wasn't... Because uh, he was the most active participant, right, right. I guess. Like, she's... Uh, trust me, we've talked about our feelings about her. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but it's but just like, one of those things where you just... It's a different scenario, so I'm hoping this would be a little different yeah you just never know but yeah. i hope with every fiber of my being that this man dies in prison keep him in there friend but lives a long life miserable in life yep and with all that being said Oof. we thank you for listening we hope you keep listening and we hope you keep it weird but never this fucking weird you will never get away with murder don't be this chris i hate you that chris